Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. We're going to go ahead and get started. I am Judith Eaton, the President of the Council for Higher Education Accreditation here in the United States, joined by my colleagues, Domenko Ubelis Trumbish, our Senior Advisor for International Affairs. This is the fourth in the CHIA CIQG webinar series. We've been focused on quality assurance, institutional autonomy. We've explored what post-COVID-19 higher education might look like and the many challenges for all of us moving forward. CHIA is a non-governmental national coordinating body here in the U.S. for accreditation and quality assurance and CIQG is our, the International Quality Group is, is our international arm. We are very fortunate uh, for this webinar to be joined by a wonderful partner, uh, the International Association of Universities uh, and our good colleague, Secretary General Illich von Lahn, will be working with us throughout the webinar. Uh, we have more than 500 people who registered for the webinar from 82 countries. For today, our focus is going to be higher education, quality assurance, and academic freedom, a matter of pressing concern all of the time, but particularly pre pressing at this moment for a variety of reasons in different countries. And to explore this, we are fortunate to have with us Shore Bergen, Marcello Noble, and Rob Quinn, uh, Illich will be giving us a bit more information uh, about our speakers, although they are also well known to many of you being national and international experts uh, in their work. Illich, thank you again for being part of this, for joining with Chia for this webinar, and let me turn things over to you. Thank you very much, um, Judith, for this uh, beautiful introduction to a joint endeavor today that uh, I very much appreciate. I would like to start by thanking uh, the um, Council for Higher Education Accreditation and the International Quality Group uh, to help host this webinar on a topic that is so important for today and for tomorrow. Um, the, the topic is the future of value-based higher education and we believed it was uh, more than time that we would dig deeper into um, the, what it means value-based higher education and quality uh, higher education and in their quality assurance. So whom better to work with than Chia? <laughs> I think uh, we will welcome people from all around the world. Uh, you said 82 countries, so many people with views on what uh, value-based higher education could be and should be uh, to build the kind of higher education that we need for today and for tomorrow. Um, academic freedom can be understood as the freedom for members of the academic communities, the researchers, the teachers, the staff uh, in general, the students in particular, to follow their scholarly activities within a framework determined by that community in respect of ethical rules, international standards, and very importantly, without outside pressure. And that is what our speakers will debate today. Before going uh, there and giving them the floor, I would like to reiterate what you uh, we just heard from Judith as well, is that this webinar uh, is, forms part of a webinar series at, the, um, at CHIA. And it also forms part of a webinar series that we launched at the International Association of Universities, a webinar series actually on the future of higher education in the short, medium, and long term. Um, like Chia, we initiated these series act to actually see what is happening at our higher education institutions around the world, uh, what the associations do, what credit um, councils for higher education accreditation uh, undertake, and to understand the broader landscape of higher education and where uh, the values such as academic freedom fit in uh, today. The whole notion of the values upon which to build higher education receives, as you said, more attention now. 
and especially given the COVID-19 pandemic and the current social unrest, which translates in not only health crises, but also in eco economic crisis, and certainly a social crisis around the world. And we will see much more of that in the aftermath of the pandemic. Many countries are still in the middle of it, and um, Marcello, Global will be, have the opportunity to also highlight what is happening in Brazil and in Latin America more specifically nowadays. And we hear a lot about it in the news, but it's good to have you with us and speak about it from your own experience. But we will see also what will remain of all of this when we get out of the pandemic. And so beyond even the health crisis, the economic and social crisis that we face, we also face a new phenomenon that is popping up and very sadly so. And it is the one that is challenging uh, issues of equity in our societies. So we will have an opportunity to discuss that as well. So this whole topic is very closely related to the one of quality assurance and uh, the attention to academic freedom is actually linked to that one. And that is what the speakers will also be talking about. We have to preserve and enhance the core values that uh, we have to use to build a better higher education for the future. And that future will go through quality review uh, of what is being uh, offered. And there is a lot of challenge to that today as well. So the webinar will debate the contours of academic freedom, both as it relates to institutions and to quality assurance as well, and how it relates in particular also to institutional autonomy, especially when we get to the European perspectives. So the questions are what rights and obligations are attached to it first, uh, when we hear from Robert Quinn uh, um, in a scholars at risk perspective. And then we will hear a perspective from Latin America and we will have a third speaker uh, to speak about the European perspective and how academic freedom there is very closely related to the concept of institutional autonomy. And we are looking at how these challenges um, do challenge the concept in itself nowadays. So I'm very honored to introduce three eminent speakers. Many of you will know them, but some will not. And so in very brief, um, I will in a minute give the floor to Robert Quinn, who is the founding executive director of the Scholars at Risk Network, an independent not-for-profit corporation based at New York University. Robert Quinn was formerly, formerly also served as a member of the Council of the Magna Carta Observatory, based in Bologna, the executive director of the Institute of International Education Scholars Rescue Fund, on the steering committee of the Network for Education and Academic Rights, based in London, and a member of the Committee on Scientific Freedom and Responsibility of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. Scholars at risk, these are only some of the few uh, um, tasks that he's taken on in the past. Uh, but it is good to hear because it also shows to what extent his current discourse is embedded in a long tradition of um, uh, defending the rights of the scholars around the world. Scholars at Risk today protects scholars suffering grave threats to their lives, liberty and well-being by arranging, for instance, temporary research and teaching positions at institutions in the network as well as by providing advisory and referral services. Scholars at Risk celebrates 20 years this year. Congratulations. The spec second speaker will come from Latin America and focus in or zoom in on um, Latin America. And Marcelo Knobel, you're the rector of the University of Campinas, also known as Unicamp in Brazil. You're also a member of the board of directors of the Brazilian Center for Research in Energy and Materials. And as a full professor of physics, you have served in the past as executive director for the Brazilian Nanotechnology National Laboratory at CNPEM. You received um, your bachelor's and doctoral degrees from Unicamp and you've worked there for a long time. So you have a very good experience from that university, but you also know the system very well in the country and in Latin America at large. And our last speaker, Schurbergen, is the head of the Council of Europe's Education Department, 
uh, your work at the council focuses on projects and recommendations on the purposes, on the values and the democra democratic mission of higher education. And we work very closely together as well, the International Association of Universities with the council. We also support SAR and we work very closely with UNICOM. But uh, just to get back to sure, you're a member of the Bologna follow-up group and, board and, and the board, and you have chaired uh, many working groups that were involved in the implementation of structural education reforms. You have written many books, many papers, and it is worth reading them. So I recommend highly uh, our three speakers also in what they have to offer in writing. You're the main author of the Lisbon Recognition Convention, as well as of recommendations on public responsibility, academic freedom, institutional autonomy, and quality of education. You're the editor of the series, um, uh, the higher education series of the Council of Europe, and you have often coordinated sessions on the future of the European higher education area at the Bologna Researchers Conference. Recently, we organized, and I was happy to be part of that global forum on academic freedom um, that was organized with partners across the Americas and, chair, and you chaired the work that, was led, um, that led to the publication more recently of the European Reference Framework of Competencies for Democratic Culture. So a long list, and you should know that this is actually only an excerpt of many of the things that the three speakers have been engaged in and contributed to, but it gives a bit of the background in which we can embed the discourse today. So without further ado, I would like to start by giving the floor to Robert Quinn, the founding executive director of Scholars at Risk. The floor is yours, Rob. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hillage. Thank you, Judith. Uh, and my thanks to Chia and to the Quality Group and to IIU, not just for today's webinar, but for all the, the partnership over the years, which is really great. Uh, and then I thank all the fellow panelists and all of the attendees. It's really wonderful to look at the chat and to see the greetings from all over the world. Uh, and I think that that really, for me, while we have differences in cultures and histories and contexts, it really does cement that we are one community of knowledge and these issues really matter uh, to all of us. So this sharing across uh, the different geographic lines is really important today. I think the title for our webinar is really apt. It's the future of higher education quality assurance, the future of academic freedom. And, and in my remarks really all boil down to imagining an equal sign between those two titles. The future of quality higher education is the future of academic freedom. It's the same thing. That's really uh, my main message. Uh, and I'll have three points to share with all of us. The first is the link between academic freedom and quality. The second is that we have a need for a greater understanding about academic freedom, the scope of academic freedom. But specifically, I'm not saying we need to define or redefine it. We have a definition. We simply need to understand it better uh, and to help others understand it. And third, the vital role that the quality assurance and accreditation community can play and must play in promoting academic freedom, protecting academic freedom. So those are my three points. I'll try to do it in, in a quick five minutes. Uh, thank you already. Illich has said I'm from Scholars at Risk. We are a global network. We have about 530 higher education institutions in 39 countries in our network. If anyone on the webinar is not familiar with us, I would welcome you to go to our website or to email me and we would love to learn more about possibly partnering with your institution. Our work does include, as Hillage said, direct protection for threatened individuals. That's the core of our work, but also we do advocacy at the international level and domestic level to try to promote academic freedom and university values. And we also do trainings within the higher education sector on core university values. Uh, and the reason I mentioned those three areas of work is because everything I'm saying uh, really just draws from the perspective of the chair I have sat in for the last 20 years where I have seen literally thousands of requests for help from scholars who feel they're being targeted or threatened. Uh, or we have monitored uh, thousands of incidents of attacks on higher education. So, uh, and to give you a sense of what that experience is, let me just read off for you a list of some of the incidents of pressures or attacks on higher education that our monitoring project has reported. And this is only in the last three weeks. Um, 
So in the last three weeks, detention of a professor at Hodaida University uh, by Houthi forces in Yemen over a Facebook post calling on them for the release of detained university students. The Zoom bombing of a virtual gender studies symposium hosted at Northwestern University in the United States in which the bombers showed images of child sexual abuse. The firing of tear gas at students at the National University of Costa Rica who were pro protesting proposed cuts to education spending. Uh, the arrest of a retired professor at Beijing University of Science and Technology in retaliation for expression online regarding COVID-19. A violent attack on principally female students at the College of Sciences and Humanities of the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM, by a group of masked individuals the arrest of a Ugandan anthropologist for protesting the government's handling of COVID-19 there, another Zoom bombing of a Chinese Students Association at California Polytechnic State University in the US, in which the bombers uh, put up racist and homophobic images and slurs, an effort by police and paramilitary groups to prevent students at Central American University in Nicaragua from carrying out a protest march over education funding. So as I said, that's only in the last three weeks. Those are the incidents that we've seen and we know we don't see all the incidents. Um, there are many other examples that I could mention and I'm sure some our other speakers will mention uh, in Brazil or perhaps in Turkey or Hungary, Russia or elsewhere uh, across Europe. And we know that the quality assurance and accreditation challenges, most quality assurance and accreditation don't touch on these types of severe pressures. But I think it's useful for this community to look through the lens of the severe because the severe cases help us focus on both the scope of academic freedom and also its importance to higher education quality. So uh, that's my experience. And so now the three points I wanted to raise. First, the link between uh, academic freedom and quality. And quite simply, academic freedom is central to quality. It is not extraneous. Um, it is the direct connection. And a corollary there is any quality measures that don't take account of academic freedom are incomplete uh, or distorting of, of academic freedom. Uh, how is it a guarantor force? Because um, academic freedom is what ensures that persons who are qualified to make decisions about the direction of research and teaching are making those decisions. So academic freedom is what protects academics to make the decisions free from outside interference. So the agency for determining the scope of academic direction must be within the higher education sector. Uh, and therefore external intrusions into that agency are improper because they erode the quality promoting function that is within academic freedom itself. Um, the second way that academic freedom promotes quality is that because academics are required when exercising that right of academic freedom to pay attention to and adhere to other core values of higher education, including especially equitable access, public accountability, institutional autonomy, and social responsibility. And if you're wondering, these values are in many, many different statements, but they're most clearly elaborated in the UNESCO statement of 1997 on the status of higher education teaching personnel. So while academic freedom uh, shouldn't be intruded into by outside, outsiders can in good faith assess how members of the academic free, uh, community are living up to these other values when they exercise their academic freedom. And that includes the quality assurance and accreditation community. It is fully appropriate for that community to look into um, the adherence to these other values and therefore to the exercise of academic freedom. So that's point one. Um, point two is that we need to have a clear understanding of what academic freedom is, the scope of academic freedom. And again, I say specifically, and we can talk about it in the discussion, we don't need to define academic freedom. We don't need to pretend that we don't know what it is, but we do need to make sure we clarify for ourselves and especially for the public what academic freedom is. So number one, academic freedom has legal and non-legal dimensions. Uh, the legal dimensions are protected by domestic and international law, in particular, international human rights law, which protects academic freedom under freedom of expression, under the right to benefits of scientific progress, and under the right to education. And um, both of these legal and non-legal dimensions are open to examination and assessment by a quality assurance or accreditation 
a process or community. Um, academic freedom also has non-expressive dimensions uh, that include um, uh, movement and travel and so forth, which are outside of the expressive dimension, but I just mentioned those so we are aware of those. Uh, because, of course, if scholars are not allowed to move about and travel and exchange with each other, that's a significant infringement. But mostly we end up talking about the expressive dimensions of academic freedom. And this is probably where the most confusion is about the scope of academic freedom. So I'll just mention in briefly that it protects scholars when they're acting uh, within uh, the as members of the higher education sector within their discipline, uh, regardless of whether the communication takes place within the higher education sector, which we would call intramural expression, or outside of the sector, which we would call extramural expression, but in both cases are protected uh, by the concept of academic freedom, including, and this is very important, including when engaging with the public. And a lot of the attacks we see on our work on academic freedom are attempts to claim that when academics speak to non-academics, they're not behaving as academics. They're act acting outside of the scope of academic freedom. We can talk about that uh, if people would like. Uh, and so then the third point I would just mention is that the quality assurance community, I believe, has an especially vital role to play in promoting academic freedom and building understanding about the link between academic freedom and quality. Uh, and this means include encouraging proactive measures, uh, such as statements of values about academic freedom that many institutions obviously already have, but these statements are not enough. We also need to have designated officials in charge, not only of receiving complaints about academic freedom, but about promoting academic freedom within our communities. We should have regular processes to make sure that the values of our institution are lived uh, and not just on a shelf somewhere. So that means annual reports on academic freedom, annual, annual assessments, onboarding training for new students or new faculty members about what academic freedom is and how to, to deploy it. Perhaps annual training for everyone in the community or coaching about how do we navigate academic freedom in the constantly changing world of higher education. For example, as we move into online spaces that are much more prominent now than they had been uh, in the past. In short, we need to invest in building a vocabulary and a culture of academic freedom so that we then know how to navigate together the challenges of balancing that uh, in and of itself. And then of course, beyond proactive, we will have to react to situations where there are threats or pressures on academic freedom. And there, we need to make sure we have transparent processes for assessing what happened from a values point of view. We need to have transparent processes for encouraging dialogue about incidents. Uh, when we have constructive dialogue about incidents, the incidents themselves can become positive exercises because they reinforce our values. When we don't talk about them and when leadership in particular makes decisions from a very narrow or small group, we end up having situations that erode uh, values. We have to do what we call in our work, grow the menu of response choices. Response choices to academic freedom issues often end up coming out as very binary. We should be there or we shouldn't be there. We should have this program or we shouldn't have this program. We need to have more subtle responses because the situation is more uh, complex. Uh, and we need to have processes that support promoting recommendations for how to improve conditions and then for assessing whether improvements have been made or not, whether there is progress or whether there is erosion. Uh, and there, my last point is that we're fortunate that now at the moment, we have many more resources available today to try to assist the quality and accreditation community in putting in place these types of measurements and assessments than we had in the past. And some of them are listed at the bottom of that slide there. And if anyone is interested in any of those, you can, you can email me, I'd be happy to send you the link. So there in our, our big recap, I think we need to have clear understanding academic freedom is a guarantor of quality and therefore it's central to the quality exercise. We need to have a clear understanding of the scope of academic freedom. Uh, and we need to have quality assurance and accreditation community know that it has a vital role to play in promoting and protecting academic freedom. Thank you.
Thank you for this excellent introduction and um, really reiterating this, um, this, these three points that we need to make sure that everybody understands what this is all about and translate it correctly also to the outside world, but certainly also inside this action that you call for and also the reaction. And we will have an opportunity to talk about that more in a minute. Uh, thank you for this, uh, this very good opening. So I would like to give the floor to Marcello uh, to uh, explain how this translates uh, in Brazil, but also in Latin America more uh, broadly speaking. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to talk. Indeed, I decided to make more uh, alert for the international community that things that seem uh, apparently okay, they, they, everything is fine, can change from one day to the other. And I would use the Brazilian uh, uh, example in order to show how things can really get really, really worse uh, every day in, the, in a context of higher education. So uh, I wrote down the, these uh, ideas in order to try to keep on my time. Let me start by, by uh, saying that uh, this Sunday, on Sunday, June 14, 2020, the Minister of Education of Brazil showed up uh, at a small pro-government demonstration in Brasilia, the, the country's capital. Without having, uh, even wearing a mask, he greeted the demonstrators and claimed, I don't want more sociologists, anthropologists. I don't want more philosophers with my money. This happened this week, while the world is facing one of the worst catastrophes in the modern history. Indeed, several demonstrations and measures enacted by the current government since assuming in January 2019 have caused great, great concern and created considerable confusion. Higher uh, education institutions in Brazil have been uh, under constant fire from the federal government that is promoting a crusade against education, science, and academic freedom. The most recent attack uh, to the uh, uh, took place just recently, now in June, June 10th, uh, amid the COVID-19 pandemics. Uh, the president, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, determined by means of a provisional measure that the rectors of the universities and federal institutes would be appointed directly by the Ministry of Education during the coronavirus pandemic, wrestling the power of choice from the academic community, which is a long and well-established established tradition in Brazilian higher education, uh, and, and indeed in Latin America as a whole. The argument that it would be not possible to vote for new rectors during the pandemic was absurd, as many activities continue remotely and there are several tools to make elections within the universities possible. Fortunately, the Senate overturned the decision two days later, as it was clearly in conflict with the Brazilian constitution that includes a specific article guaranteeing the autonomy of universities. However, this affront to autonomy was not an isolated incident. In a country with many challenges at all levels of education, a considerable number of Brazilian politicians, including the president himself, uh, believes that the national priority is to fight against the alleged communist brainwashing taking place in schools and university. Many politicians encourage, encouraged students to point their cell phone cameras at teachers during classes to record what they believe to be a Marxist propaganda. The Minister of Education discourse ranged, ranged from silly claims that uh, there were uh, wheat plantations and naked people on public university campuses to serious policy proposals that would limit scholarship to so-called priority areas that would exclude, for example, humanities and most of the basic sciences. This assault on higher education takes place in a context of misconceptions and fake news spread over social networks that portray public universities as dens of leftists, perdition, drugs, nudity, eschatology, and also inefficient and expensive. Just to mention one example, the president claimed 
that the public higher education institutions are unproductive. Yet, while they represent only 12% 12, 12 of the national system, they are responsible for more than 95% of the national research output. Uh, well, the, the government started with a, a, a person called Ricardo Velas Rodriguez as the Minister of Education. His terms was marked by great stability owing to an internal war from different ideological currents within the government. Velas Rodriguez claimed that the idea of university for all people does not exist. Universities should be reserved for an intellectual elite. Of course, this was considered particularly offensive in Brazil after years of public policies directed towards broadening access and democratizing public higher education. In March uh, uh, of 2019, the announcement of 40% cut of the Ministry of Science and Technology budget was met with shock because there had been a promise during the campaign of increasing investment in science, technology, and innovation from 1.5% to 3% of the GDP, which would, would be comparable to Europe. This decision of, provoked broad consternation because of its harmful consequence to the universities and society at large. Uh, economist Abraham Weintraub replaced Velis Rodriguez as the Ministry of Education in April 2019. Immediately following his appointment, uh, the President Bolsonaro announced on Twitter that the new minister was proposing cuts to schools of philosophy and sociology, indicating his preference to focus on fields that generate an immediate return to the taxpayer, such as veterinary medicine, engineering, and medicine. The dismissal of humanities and social science reflects the ideological position of the government is another example of its hostility towards public universities and academics. Uh, the, the situation, well, please, next, uh, next slide. Uh, the situation became even worse in 2020 when the federal government announced the change of rules and the distribution of research grants from the, the federal agencies, pr prioritizing only technological areas. Under the pretext of valuing the acceleration of the country's economic and social development, they reduced its funding for research in the humanities, uh, basic science, and the arts. It's worth noting here uh, uh, regarding accreditation that the the agency CAP, CAPES here in Brazil and the Ministry of Education are responsible for the assessment of and accreditation of higher education in Brazil. And the restriction of research to few priority fields puts academic freedom and development of many areas in great risk. Next slide, please. Although the perspectives and measures proposed by the President and the Ministry of Education have not been well received by Brazilian society, and are attracting international attention and condemnation, we will still believe that these steps hint at a potential calamity for science and higher education in Brazil. The international university community must be made aware of what is happening in Brazil today. The attempt to silence our academics and control our universities puts democracy, development, and social well being at risk across the country, and it represents a want in the worldwide achievements of university autonomy and academic freedom as well. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Marcelo Knobo, for this very telling um, account of what is happening uh, so tragically in Brazil nowadays. Um, what is very surprising, but maybe not so, is that there is this constant uh, mis mistrust of higher education or attempt to show that higher education is not providing the kind of grounds that are um, uh, conducive to uh, developing our societies for the better. And we've had that discussion in many different fora. It is as if continuously university is to um, to show and to demonstrate how uh, it actually is 
of service to society and it continuously is, is uh, the case is made that it is the, the opposite. Also very interesting this um, uh, too often attack on the social sciences and humanities because that is where the critical thinking uh, is being fostered and, and is so um, basically important to the development of our societies. Uh, I am uh, convinced that Schurbergen will pick up on these topics as raised by Robert and by you in his presentation as well. So before getting into a, a discussion further uh, here again, I would like to warmly thank you, Marcello, for sharing all these uh, pieces of information and uh, to, to maybe say also on behalf of Judith that organizations like CHIA and the IAU are there also to, um, to raise the points made by Robert and by you, uh, also uh, at the global level, so that indeed these concerns are being heard and that the international community can hopefully help uh, to, to, uh, um, to help turn the situation, if at all possible. I give the floor to Shur, uh, because you will probably pick up on some of these issues as well. Thank you very much, Elich. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from Strasbourg. Um, Helich, since you mentioned the Lisbon Recognition Convention, let me just uh, start by saying that we have another main author with us, of course, uh, Stameko Village Trombich, who was at um, UNESCO uh, when we wrote the uh, convention. Now, I start by showing a map simply to show that when, it, when we talk about Europe, we mean it. We include the 47 member states of the Council of Europe, the 48 member states of the European higher education area and the 50 countries that have signed the European Cultural Convention. So it really is Europe in the full sense. In this Europe, we have some concepts and that will be my next slide. Um, so in the next slide, you will see three concepts. Um, academic freedom, institutional autonomy and quality. The, the reason for putting the first two concepts is that in Europe, discussion very often focuses on institutional autonomy rather than academic freedom, but even more so, very often the two are confused to the sense that you think that if you have one, you have the other. It's important to keep in mind that when you talk about academic freedom, you really talk about individuals, individual members of the, acad of the academic community. Whereas when you talk about institutional freedom, you talk about the whole academic community together and the way it's organized. Um, there are two main arguments for why both academic freedom and institutional autonomy are important. The first is democracy. I would submit that you cannot have democracy in the full sense of the word without academic freedom and also institutional autonomy and that you cannot have either of those fully without democracy. But as uh, both Robert and Marcelo also pointed out, you cannot have quality unless you have academic freedom and institutional autonomy. Um, now quality you can think of in terms of the, how good an institution or a program is, but you can also think of it as how good an education system is. And one thing we're saying is, First of all, you cannot have a good education system unless you're inclusive, but you also cannot have a quality higher education system unless it addresses all the major purposes of higher education, certainly preparing for the labor market. That's, that's what we all see in public debate. But it is also, in our view, about preparing for life as active citizens in democratic societies, it is about personal development. That's the original purpose of education, but nobody talks about it anymore. And it is about um, having a broad and advanced knowledge base. Now, on my next slide, you will see some major issues. But the first point I would like to make is that academic freedom does not exist, or that there's no country that does not have some degree of issues with, um, with uh, academic free institutional autonomy. This is not just an issue for the naughty few and the, and the um, great majority is fine. Some countries have bigger issues than others, but most countries have issues. And very often 
you're talking about gray zones also. If things were clear cut, we probably wouldn't have had this webinar today. Now, some of the issues are politically salient, as Robert and as Marcelo have pointed out very much. And we have those in Europe too. We have seen political pressure, we have seen political attacks on the fundamental values of higher education, as we tend to refer to them um, in the European higher education area. When Belarus was admitted to um, the Bologna process, the European higher education area in 2015, it came with a roadmap. And uh, part of that roadmap was on academic freedom and institutional autonomy. If you look at the report on the implementation of the um, EHEA, you will find that three countries are mentioned specifically as having issues with uh, academic freedom and institutional autonomy. Hungary, in large part, but not only because of the Central European University, which is probably the most high profile case in Europe. It had to essentially move from Budapest to Vienna. Um, Russia and also Turkey, especially in the aftermath of the failed coup in uh, 2016. But, and that'll be my final slide. Not all issues around the um, academic freedom are high profile political issues. Then we need to be aware of some of the lower profile day to day issues. In Europe, the conception has largely been that we're talking about the legal relationship between public authorities and individual scholars or institutions. So if your law says that you have academic freedom, you do. I think it's worth looking a little bit more about what that actually means. Funding, of course, is important. You cannot have higher education quality if you don't have funds. Now, can you publish anything you want? Or are there instructions in your funding uh, on when and what you can actually publish? Are there is funding given on block or is it mainly given for very specific purposes? Nobody would dispute, I think that, at least in Europe, that public authorities have a responsibility for the overall issue of the overall edu higher education system. So it would be legitimate for, higher, for a public authority to say that in this particular part of the country, we need an institution, but it would be illegitimate for the um, public authorities to then say, and this institution has to teach exactly this and all scholars in the institutions have to teach by this and this book. The, I think also the, um, when you talk about quality, you need to make sure that quality is not perceived too technically. We t tend to think of quality as something that's just out there and all we have to do is achieve it. I would submit that um, it doesn't make sense to talk about quality unless you have a notion of what quality is, as I showed in the first slide. I think it's telling that one of the discussions we have within the um, Bologna process now is whether um, the issue of academic freedom should be reflected specifically in the European standards and guidelines for quality assurance if and when they are um, re reviewed at some future date. And there's actually been quite a lot of discussion around it. I think I'll leave it at that because I, I think we're um, running uh, a bit behind schedule, but I'd be very happy to come back to some of these issues in the discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, very good presentation, also on the situation as it uh, pertains to the European continent at large. Uh, you showed it in the map. It is not, uh, it is not a, a small area that is covered there with all its uh, uh, challenges as well uh, on the um, European continent. Uh, it is very good to compare the notes between the scholars at risk um, uh, point of view, the point of view of, of you as a rector in the university and then in a, in a country that is, um, and I would find no other term at this point, but rocked so much in terms of, uh, and, and even at odds with its future when 
the government interferes so much as to what kind of um, an education can be uh, proposed and, and who is to lead the institution and what is the budget to be used for, etc. I've looked at all the questions now in the, in the box and um, I see that these questions are equally important to all three presentations. Um, there is there's this, this this sentence that you used, uh, Marcello, that uh, probably is at the heart of, of much that is being used against universities. Very, too often, um, universities are being accused of not delivering on their promise and not serving the society in the ways that they should serve the society. That is being used uh, to also say, well, education and higher education in particular is um, is mainly for personal development, and you said so, sure. And it's as if we have no right to say so anymore because even that is misinterpreted. The um, importance of personal development should, on the contrary, be celebrated um, because it is indeed by um, offering the opportunity to individuals to uh, access personal development and acquire a broad advanced knowledge base, uh, those two points that you raised at the beginning of your presentation as well, are those that will benefit the entire society. But that's, it's as if this personal um, development is not seen and valued by uh, the entire society and the world outside of the, um, of the academic community as, as being uh, of importance for the future of our societies at large. And then very often the, the reductionist view and the attacks on universities are easily made by it's expensive, uh, the budget should be used for something else, um, the return on investment is not there, um, and that is then um, and the, the lever used to uh, attack the universities um, right from the bottom. Um, many questions refer to that, even in the chat box. Even some may have uh, interpreted the words as, well, what, what is it that you would see the budget could be used for better? And I think it's important to also look at those aspects again, because they have been asked in, in the chat box and reiterate that, um, yes, we need to affirm the, the very important role of higher education on and on again. But why is it that that role is not recognized today? And why are academics uh, and due to everything that they do in terms of research, teaching, community engagement, not valued um, uh, to the point where it allows them to operate as they should in society. So I give you the floor to each of you before turning to you, Judith, to uh, ask the questions uh, to the three speakers. So may I start with you, um, Robert, and, and try to, uh, to, to pick up on some of those points. Terrific, thank you. Yeah, and I've been trying to follow along in the chat and the questions as well. Um, uh, so there's a lot of points in there. I, you know, I think number one, and I, uh, I think we have to we have to put a frame on it. Of, are the are the comments and questions not in our seminar, but what we see in public discourse? Are they good faith questions and statements, or are they masking an agenda? Right. And so in our work, most of the people raising the phrases about um, the university not serving society are doing so to advance a political agenda to try to shrink the voice of the university in society. So and I think we need to be clear, we have to separate that out because it's a legitimate line of good faith inquiry. And I think higher education regularly is asking itself, how can it engage with society? How can it serve society? So on the good faith side of that equation, I think the sector needs to do a better job communicating uh, with the audience beyond the people it's directly touching. So we already do, our universities are very, very engaged in communities, uh, but in some ways we've fallen into a trap of trying to not be political actors and therefore not necessarily fully engaging with the full public audience about the importance and meaning of higher education, even for people who aren't necessarily going to higher education. Uh, and this is also part of buying into the challenges of funding models uh, where we're trying to raise money for institutions, especially in North America, but even in other parts of the world now, uh, where then that 
bleeds then into the conversation about uh, higher education being a commodity and students being consumers and not individuals trying to develop their capacities and so forth. So, so I think there's one set of these conversations that are in the good faith discussions, they're legitimate. And I think the answer to that is the people in higher education assuming the responsibility for communicating why this matters and the conversations we're already having internally with the wider audience. The other side of it is the bad faith assertions there. Uh, and there, I think we need to call them out and expose that this isn't really an intention to try to serve society when a populist argument questions the value of social sciences, for example. Um, it really is an attempt to control power. Uh, and that's what we see in the attacks on scholars all over the world. We see on the attacks on students. When they ask questions of power, they get attacked. And the more sophisticated attackers know how to use language as their primary weapon, uh, the less sophisticated use force uh, uh, there. So, uh, and I, so I think I would, I would leave it there. I think they're all valid points, but when we blend the two conversations about the good faith assertions and the bad faith assertions, it's hard to make progress on either one. Yeah. Thank you very much. Here yeah, you touch on, on many important points. Albert Schramm made that uh, comment yep. in, the, uh, in the chat box as well, where he says that uh, uh, good higher education also leads to active citizenship and activism, and that is not appreciated by too many of the governments around the world. Do you, do you want to pick up on that, uh, Marcello? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I fully agree with Robert. I, and indeed, what, ha what is happening right now in this uh, pandemic uh, is that paradoxically uh, we have uh, been under a, a strong attack here in Brazil and in Latin America and now during the pandemic suddenly the universities uh, got more space on the media and we, we our the public perception of science technology the universities themselves uh, is uh, improving uh, very much so we should use uh, these uh, Pub, uh, you know, public perception in order to leverage our uh, value to society. We should show, and, and this is something that I am pointing out uh, really strongly uh, these days, is that we should, as universities, as pub, uh, higher education institutions, improve our communication to society. We are failing on that. We don't know the contemporary ways in order to make good uh, communication of what we do and what we represent for the uh, well-being of society and for the future of the countries that we are in. So we should use this opportunity in order to, to make this point clearly. And this is really, really important. Just to mention one example, here in Brazil, we don't have the, 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 the culture of philanthropy that uh, uh, you have in the United States or in many parts of the world. Uh, just by uh, starting around the, the, the pandemic, we initiated a, a donation campaign, a volunteer campaign, something that was not existent at all at the university, and the society responded very well. So this is an opportunity that we should use in order to change the culture, to make stronger links with the society that we serve. And this is fundamental in order to make the value of universities uh, clear for everyone, including maybe the politicians. Maybe, maybe even start with them. <laughs> that <laughs> seems to be, uh, um, yes, I, I laugh about it because it seems obvious and it is certainly not, and it is so uh, heart and center of much of the debates. Um, would you like to pick up on what has been just said? Sure. And maybe also uh, one of the questions in the, in the chat box now with the um, academic freedom being challenged as well by the funding uh, bodies um, in that they also play a role nowadays in challenging uh, the autonomy of institutions and their right to decide on what to research for what purpose uh, and in what context. So maybe you, you could pick up on that and then thank you. Do this. Uh, the floor will be yours. <laughs> thank, th thank you. Thank you, Heliki. Well, I think that links also um, to your opening question in a sense, you know, how do you respond to the people who say we have to be useful to society? Well, the trouble is that many of those who made that assertion have a very narrow concept of what is useful and they have a very narrow concept of what is society. Um, 
my favorite quote on education just about comes from a Chilean sociologist, Eugenio Tironi, who says that if you want to answer the question of what kind of education do we need, first you have to answer another question, what kind of society do we want? And I think the problem both with politicians, but also many public and private funders, is that their time horizon is very limited. It's the next election, the next ballot sheet, whatever. Uh, if as a society, we lose the ability to think in the longer term, if you lose the ability to balance short-term gain and long-term inconvenience, but even more the other way around, short-term inconvenience for longer-term gains, if you, need, if you lose the ability to say that, okay, this may be a disadvantage to me, but for society, it makes sense. If we lose a sense of public purpose, then we're certainly in trouble as societies. And maybe one of the questions that we should ask ourselves as higher education people is, do we actually develop these competences in, in our students to develop, develop these competences in higher education? And I'm not sure the answer is yes. I think we're better than we've ever been at educating subject specialists. I'm less sure that we're good at educating intellectuals, by which I mean people who can put their subject-specific competence into a broader question, ask the critical questions, but more importantly and more difficult, find the answer to those, um, to those uh, fundamental questions. Now, one final point. I see there are several questions about commercialization. Higher education does have economic importance, and it should. It should not be a business. And language is important here, at least in Europe, but I think other parts of the world also. We see some shift in no longer talking about students, but talking about customers or clients. That's not just a semantic difference. A customer or a client shops for a service. If you find the service, you're happy. If you don't find the service, you're not happy. And if you're not happy, you go elsewhere. You don't have no intrinsic interest in the inner workings of the service provider, unless uh, you know it's a very blatant example of child labor or something like this. A student is different. In Europe, as uh, European ministers have said at least twice, students are members of the academic community. Being a member of community means that if you're unhappy with the community, you stay and you fight to change it. And only in the extreme cases do you leave it by immigration. So the difference between students being students and students being customers is really fundamental to the future of academic freedom and institutional autonomy in our societies. Judith, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, Willich, and thank you to our presenters and the most thoughtful commentary, as well as the many uh, very, very thoughtful and reflective comments and questions in the, in the chat. Uh, let me focus on, on just several issues that have come up a number of times from our colleagues on this webinar. Um, first, COVID-19, uh, and this would be for any or all of our presenters. Uh, we have one comment that COVID-19 uh, could be used as a tactic to restrict academic freedom. And we have a question about the status of academic freedom during COVID-19 and after COVID-19. I know we've touched on, on this a bit, but more explicitly, given COVID-19 and what has happened, hopefully temporarily with higher education uh, around the world, uh, thoughts about COVID-19 as a tactic or uh, where do we go when we are beyond COVID-19 with regard to academic freedom? Rob? Yeah, so thank you. And I saw all the comments in there. So I, I would break it again into two categories. You have the intentional 
um, negative dimensions of COVID-19. And we're already seeing that in our work. I already referred to that in my opening remarks of just in the last three weeks, two or three professors who have had uh, attacks against them because of COVID expression. And so there's three types of attacks that we're already seeing and we will continue to see. So the big message, there will be more attacks on higher education, on academic freedom because of this than previously, and they were already on the rise. So one is people who are working on the virus itself and trying to put out honest research information that counters the narrative of the state that they're in uh, and the state therefore puts pressure on them. Uh, the other are scientists that will start examining in a historical lens state responses or non-state responses to the virus and be critical of those responses. And we will see those scholars being targeted for telling the truth about the mistakes that were made. Of course, mistakes that are important to know for next time, right? But but there'll be pressure there. And number three are the states that are using the virus merely to cover up a crackdown on thought or inquiry that they would have liked to have done anyhow, but they're now been granted emergency powers that they otherwise might not have been able to, to exercise. So that's the intentional side. But connecting to what Shor just said, there's also on the unintentional side. And so we're going to see a lot of pressure. We're already seeing it the dynamics of pushing students into seeing themselves as consumers because they're now taking classes online and they're not on a campus anymore, right? So that dynamic of consumerism is going to be heightened. And if we don't do a better job bringing forward the value of the content and the ideas as the primary, um, that pressure is, is going to grow and harm higher education. Uh, the other that I worry most about in the unintentional is much of the space for the dynamic of learning and inquiry happens in uncontrolled spaces at our institutions, uh, in hallways, in uh, you know plazas, in rooms, in cafeterias. And when our universities have gone virtual into literally entirely controlled spaces, how do we make sure there's room for that free exchange of ideas that isn't necessarily the structured idea, uh, but what grows out of the structured content? Uh, and I welcome any input on people who have started to explore that. But where is the free conversation when a university is restricted to the space of Zoom windows? Really good, good point. Uh, sure, were you going to comment on the COVID-19 situation, please? You're on yes, your please. Um, I think it illustrates, in addition to what Robert said, with which I entirely agree, I think it also really illustrates part of the it's complicated relationship between public authorities and the scholarly community. I think it's entirely legitimate for public authorities to say, we have a crisis, we need the input from higher education to solve it. So we're putting funding at disposal to encourage individual researchers and institutions now to focus as much as they can on finding a response to the uh, COVID crisis, whether that's a medical response whether it's a, a social response or other aspects of um, what ac the academic community can help with. It would not be legitimate for public authorities or for funders to say, we don't accept, however, we do research on this, but only do technical research. As Robert said, we don't accept uh, research that shows that the government response to the crisis has failed. Um, is it legitimate for uh, a private funder to say you do research uh, on the vaccine or whatever, but your research result you give to me, you don't publish them. So they, won't, they will not be accessible to everyone. So I really think this crisis uh, you know, d illustrates some of the underlying issues related to academic freedom more broadly. And keep in mind, the academic community can only help solve the COVID crisis because it's been doing fundamental research in a number of disciplines over years. If you haven't done that research under academic freedom, you can't now suddenly start researching and think you'll solve the COVID crisis two weeks from now. Thank you. Uh, Marcello, some of your earlier comments about the way certain fields or disciplines had been, to use a polite word, discouraged by government in Brazil uh, were echoing to me can, thoughts about COVID-19 in Brazil and what you see happening. Well, <laughs> there are so many things happening. Uh, I, won't, uh, I don't want to go into the details, but I, I mentioned already 
one example from the government trying to control the, the nomination of rectors and presidents of the universities during this period. But there is a, a, also a dimension that was not mentioned yet here, the financial crisis that comes with the, the pandemic. And just to mention one example that happened in Brazil, the federal government, the federal government uh, decided, well, uh, was asked to give some financial help for the states. In uh, return from this financial aid from the federal government, they, uh, they passed a law that uh, completely hinders any progress, any career development, any a contract, new contract in the public in the public servant system. So all the public universities are within that. So we are not, we are uh, stuck up to December 2021. We don't have, we will not have any raise in the in our salaries, any progress in our careers, anything at all for two years. So this is something that is uh, uh, happening just now here in Brazil. Just to mention. Uh, the other dimension that was already mentioned uh, uh, already. So uh, 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 as a rector, I had, for example, to, ma to make a warning, a public warning in order uh, for, for the, the society not to use uh, without any, uh, you know, any consent from the doctor, the, the use of uh, medicines that were not scientifically yet uh, uh, good uh, or, or, or certainly good for uh, uh, treating the disease. One example is the chlorokine that was uh, uh, very much used in the United States. And uh, we made a, a, a warning from the university. I, I signed it as a rector and I was extremely attacked from, uh, from many, 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 many people uh, in, in several, uh, you know, social media and so on. I received some uh, very strong letters from all over the country. And many scientists and journalists are being attacked uh, uh, owing to, this, to the, their position against uh, unproven uh, scientifically drugs. So this is something that is, is happening very much here in Brazil. And there are so many dimensions, direct attacks, as mentioned, also financial attacks, uh, and so, uh, many, many ways in order to, uh, to, to attack the public servants, and in particular, the public universities. Uh, thank you, Marcello. Uh, in the name of, in many countries, certainly in the US, in the name of a public health emergency, governments have been enabled to take a variety of actions to protect the citizenry. And some of this, is, of course, is, has been essential. But I, uh, I couldn't help but reflect on uh, a comment, sure, that you made uh, a few months ago in, in March. Sure, Bergen did a wonderful uh, policy brief for CIA, CIQG on institutional autonomy and academic freedom. And, and sure, in that, you talked about the cumulative impact of rules and regulations and the role of public authorities that, however, unintentionally, could curtail academic freedom and, and how we deal with that. So COVID-19, an interim period, uh, not the new normal, but an interval. And we are not going to have to uh, be worried about this unintentionality with regard to academic freedom in the future. Uh, how do we reflect on this, be aware of it? Well, since you asked me, maybe I, I, I should come in. I think that there's nothing that's as difficult to legislate as common sense. So um, laws and regulations that have good intentions sometimes have unintended consequences. For example, uh, there are good reasons for why public authorities would pass laws limiting the number of hours that you can be required to work per week. In France, currently, the, the norm is 35 hours. Now, there are, there are situations in which we need flexibility. Um, anybody who runs an experiment would know that, uh, a scientific experiment would know that you can't just close it after 35 hours. So we would need the flexibility 
um, to uh, try to say in the longer term, in the broader context, our labor legislation needs to be applied, but we need to make some adaptations to the specific requirements of academic of, of higher education. Otherwise, you cannot really uh, do um, do research. Um, no institution would be uh, would claim to be exempt from public safety regulations, and yet you need to look to make sure that uh, public safety regulations are used to ensure public safety and not the safety of the government in place from criticism at any one time. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, another comment question that has come up uh, a number of times, uh, and we've touched on this in a number of ways, is if it's the national government that is challenging, if not attacking academic freedom, how can acting internationally be effective? Now, we know we have some tools, Scholars at Risk is, is Rob a, a tool to address this. Um, we mentioned, you mentioned Rob, the UNESCO statement on, on act, academic freedom. Uh, we've had a comment about Magna Carta, but additional thoughts with regard to if it's a national government that is undermining and, and perhaps intentionally academic freedom, how can we make a more powerful use of what we do internationally? And are there additional international activities in which uh, we might engage or we might develop? Any thoughts about that from our, uh, our panelists? Marcello, how do we help Brazil? Oh, uh, I, well, of course, Robert is the, the specialist on this, but uh, I, would, I would like to say that we should go to a next level in this regard, because we, we, we are tired of, of too many declarations and, and, and paper, and we need to, to have more action, uh, a specific action. Let me give you an example. In the case of Brazil, we are not uh, uh, facing a disaster just only in higher education of academic freedom. We are living a disaster in many areas. And one of them is, the, for example, the uh, sustainability, uh, the Amazon. Let's, say the, let's give the example of the Amazon and the, and the, the problems with the bio, uh, biodiversity and so on. Uh, as soon as something happens in this area, the international community uh, should say, to the country, look, if you don't pay attention to, to the Amazon, you don't pay attention to biodiversity, we will not buy anything else from you at all. So this is a, a pressure, a, an economic pressure that is really important nowadays. Many policies that were uh, thought by this government regarding uh, uh, this uh, issue of, uh, you know, the, the, the conservation of, of the forest and the Amazon, were hindered by the response from the academic, not the academic, from the international community saying, if you, especially Europe, if you, if you continue to do this kind of policies, we will not buy any more products from Brazil. So this is something that we should try, I don't know how, but we should try to make uh, similar things happen in the, in the level of uh, the, the academy, academic freedom, and so on. So this is just an idea. I don't know how to do it, but in, in any way, we should go to this next level uh, in order to make uh, really the statements more clear for the countries that uh, go beyond this uh, very uh, specific line. Thank you, Marcello. Rob, you were very explicit in your comments uh, about the need to go from verbal support, as important as that is, to action. And you were talking about, about quality assurance, but can you speak uh, a bit more about this in this more general context and about uh, dealing with, with national governments internationally? 
Uh, sure, and I, you know, I fully agree with Marcello. We need to push to action, right? It's easy to say academic freedom is important and we all care about it. And many states that violate it grossly say that uh, all the time, right? So the way we've structured our work at Scholars at Risk is we approach from three different vectors, right? So for individuals who are targeted, the most in danger, we try to work directly with the individual. So that's usually working without contact with states or around the contact of states. Uh, and that's the higher education sector itself saying we're going to do something for these individuals, right? Second is then we do work with states and we try to work either with the generally well-behaving states to get them to put positive pressure, peer pressure uh, on states that aren't behaving particularly well, or we try to use the tools of the human rights movement and the multilateral state entities. So that's the UN, um, the OAS has recently taken an interest in academic freedom uh, the African Union, uh, the EU uh, Parliament made a recommendation last year and so forth. Uh, and then the third track, and I think that's the most promising track, is what we can do within higher education itself, right? So higher education isn't a state. It doesn't have the hard force uh, of, of law or military force or so forth, and we wouldn't want to use it for these things anyhow. What we do have is the tremendous resources of the higher education sector, uh, that is heavily reputation based uh, and even states that have real problems with their higher education like to think that they have good universities and so forth. So I think the most important thing for this community is how do we make sure when we're engaging in places where there are pressures, serious pressures, that we talk about those and we bring them up and we make it clear that it's important that values like autonomy and equity and academic freedom have to be part of the partnerships that we're engaging with. So Brazil, as an example, has spent the last 20 years investing heavily in internationalization of higher education and really in some ways being a leader of supporting cross-border scholarships and fellowships and so forth. So I think we need to develop really focused responses that constantly bring it up to raise the cost of negative state behavior and make it harder for positive reputation issues to flow to places that aren't respecting. And, you know, connecting to what Source said a second ago, you know, on the point of common sense is hard to legislate. The reason academic freedom matters so much is because it's the cornerstone. It's the thing that makes the whole complex system self-correcting. When there is academic freedom, academics, researchers can, can examine all of the difficult inequitable issues in society and bring them up for discussion over and over and over again to try to make things better, right? So that's why states target academic freedom because they don't want that change engine to exist. So they try to shut it down by shutting down academic freedom. So we need very, very vigorous soft power action in, in a way is what I, I hear you saying. Well, I'm saying was we need to we need to approach from all sides, right? Yeah. So state action is very important, and, and maybe Sewer can talk about. I know the the European higher education area is wrestling with this and trying to figure out how it can move beyond the basic statements uh, and get some monitoring or measuring or something about adherence to the values because of the problems that have been happening. So what we need to do is approach the problem from multiple sides and multiple levels because it is a multi-sided, multi-level problem. Thank you, so. Sure, yeah. we're going to reply to that. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll try. Um, it is a dilemma. Um, and part of the problem, of course, is that adherence to academic freedom is more difficult to measure than, say, whether you have developed a qualifications framework or not. Um, but we're, we're, we're putting forward a proposal to the ministerial conference in Rome in November of this year. Now, I think there are two things that make me somewhat concerned. One, of course, has to do with peer pressure, which I agree we have to continue to do. Peer pressure works wonderfully when you have a large group of peers pressuring a relatively small group. I think one of the reasons why um, the peer pressure and also the sanctions on apartheid South Africa was worked was there, there were very few people uh, and certainly few governments actually defended the apartheid regime. Now you have, I think, a larger group of people in the governments who actually would not uh, adhere fully other than in this course to the notion that academic freedom is very important. So uh, that would be, we need 
to create greater understanding also among public governments of the importance of academic freedom. I think the quality argument certainly is an important part of that. But the quality ar argument hinges on my other factor, which is acceptance of the fact that research and higher education make a difference. And I think one part of the tendencies that we're seeing, certainly on the populist right, maybe also part of the smaller populist left, is that uh, the notion that truth matters is waning. So it's not, I mean, they used to say you, you can dispute the interpretation of facts, but you can't dispute the facts. Well, increasingly, um, there is this notion of my facts are as good as your facts. That points, I think, to a challenge for higher education, maybe also a failure of higher education. We need to establish the notion that facts can be established and then you interpret them. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was one Please. other, oh, I'm sorry, Rob, go ahead. Sorry, can I just throw in there? Because to sure. some degree that dynamic started in the university right? Because we were unpacking old ideas that were put forward by subsets of humanity as rock solid truth. And we deconstructed things, right? And then the public wasn't part of that conversation. All they heard was truth doesn't matter or truth isn't true or truth is relative. And so to some degree, we started that problem and then it was picked up by politicians as a very useful dynamic. So, so I think the answer to that is, is not to back off, but to do more public education, to dive in you know, more deeply into engaging the public. And in a weird way, COVID is a tremendous opportunity because as I think one of the other great quotes out there is, is facts are stubborn things, right? And they will make themselves known eventually, you know, and this is one of them. So. Uh, thank you, Rob. I mean, that's really, I think, significant for us. Uh, the one other issue I wanted to raise, and I'll just maybe raise it, it's a big topic and I shouldn't be doing it with five minutes left, but I will. Th and that is um, current social unrest around the world. And it is different in different countries. It, it is agonizingly, painfully tied to race in the United States. And we are struggling mightily here. Uh, and I, I hope the struggles lead to lead to uh, improvement. Uh, but Rob, you touched on this at the beginning that there are academic freedom issues here when academics speak out, depending on the context. I know this shades off into, into free speech, but it, at some point I would hope that we could talk more about the social unrest, whatever the causes, economic, uh, race, health, uh, whatever, and academic freedom and both the challenge and our responsibilities uh, down the road. But maybe that's the, the, next, uh, the next webinar. Uh, Illich, did you uh, have any, any other comments? I wanna thank, first let me thank all of our presenters. I think this has been extraordinarily valuable, uh, thoughtful and, and thought provoking. And we're very grateful to you and Illich to you for your moderating. Did you have any any final thoughts? Yeah, thank you, uh, Judith, for this excellent um, Q and A session. Uh, you really pinpointed to all the issues that were raised in the chat box. That I was tempted to intervene a few times because this discussion is so important for the future, not only for higher education but for our society. Um, what I found very interesting as well is that we talk about public higher education and you, you pointed to that all three speakers and you as well, Judith. I think that this is all, another point that we make a lot at the International Association of Universities is that we have to engage with all the higher education uh, providers. So we need to include the, the private sector, we need to include the vet, we need to include the more um, uh, technological, um, tech-based tech uh, education. We need to look at all the tertiary education altogether and ensure that at all the levels, the value-based higher education is right and center uh, of the development of these institutions and the systems themselves. 
And what, there is one comment that I found uh, interesting in, in the box as well. More academics should get into politics. Today, there is, there is something true to that because some people also are reluctant to get into politics because you give your life away and you have to make big choices as to where you want to make sure that you will you will be able to, to play the, the role that you will be assigned if ever elected or become a politician. But it would be very interesting to look at the, the, the academic background of our politicians and to see how that shapes our society today. And maybe there is really something to say for a, a better a connection between the, um, the, the, the types of higher education that are out there and ensure that all of them do have this focus on democracy and the rule of law, the, 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 um, the importance of values of ethics as um, and the, the critical thinking. And I am afraid that in some of the, uh, the, the systems, the, the rationalization of the type of education that is being provided uh, is such that there is little space for that, that there is no real connect with all the disciplines. There's, there is no real connect with uh, social sciences, humanities, or the, 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 the hard sciences, to call it that, or to the arts, but that we need to ensure that the future of higher education at large, all the systems, all the kinds of education that's being offered to anyone always has these different dimensions uh, included as well, because I am convinced from everything that I just heard again today, that that is the way forward. We have to connect the science, um, the science uh, disciplines. We have to connect the science uh, basis. We have to connect in order for those who come out of any kind of higher education to become the kind of citizens that will help shape the kind of world, as you have said, that we want, because that is where the future should lay. Uh, we also at the IAU put an enormous emphasis over these past few months on the importance of Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals, because that is an agenda that will be wiped off the table as soon as possible because it will be deemed again, as um, Bob, Bob said at the beginning, inefficient, um, expensive, maybe not there that we should put uh, our emphasis today. And we're convinced uh, with the IAU board, with the IAU membership, with our partners, that on the contrary, these uh, topics are essential for our future and they should again be at the heart of uh, the focus of the development of quality higher education as well. So I just wanted to make those two points because they came up somehow also directly and indirectly in the chat box and because they came up directly also in the, in the wonderful speeches we've heard. So I would like to start by thanking uh, you, Judith, and also Stamenka Uvalic Trumbic, whom we don't see on the screen, but know is one of the architects behind uh, this uh, very uh, webinar. And I would like to thank uh, Shur, uh, Robert, and Marcello for uh, your excellent presentations, which are only an appetizer for other discussions we should have on this very broad topic that should stay on the table on and on again uh, in order for us to be able to address the future in the best possible way. So I would leave it at this, and I don't know if uh, Judith, you would give the floor to each of everyone for one minute uh, reaction so that we can close with your voices rather than uh, mine. <laughs> well, I'm happy to do that as long as Zoom doesn't cut us off. Uh, okay. All right, but, uh, but Rob, one any minute. quick <laughs> comment from you? Uh, really just to thank everyone, especially I, I'm trying to skim the chat, to, but you know, it's people all over the, we always say in our work, our work is not a conversion project. We're not trying to convince anyone that academic freedom matters. Our work is based on the fact that there are people in higher education communities all over the world that already understand these values and are trying to live and, and spread these values. And so I think a webinar like this is great and all of you in the participants in the chat you know, let's find ways to link up and, as Marcelo said, move towards action uh, in very small, concrete ways um, that I think can move things forward. Thank you, Rob. Uh, sure. I just uh, really to say a big thank you. I find it very stimulating. And um, I wish we would also have time to discuss uh, Judith's last point, but let that be a topic for another seminar. So thank you both to the CIA and the IAU. Thank you. And Marcella. 
Oh, I also, I would like to thank everyone. It's also, I, I always try to go with an optimism and, and these kind of webinars are fantastic. We are reaching now hundreds of people all around the world. And this is something that I, I really hope that uh, we keep doing after the, the pandemic is, is gone. So thank you very much for the opportunity and for the conversation. It was really great. And thank you, everyone. Take care.